this morning. Let's do this before the message we sent uh, yesterday, just a polite reminder regarding the policies we have in place so that we can reassemble. Let's take a moment to review that information just in case you missed it. Pastor wrote, imagine you were someone who falls into the at-risk category, and we do have many of those in our congregation, and you really want to be in church but have genuine medical reasons to stay away, the pastors assured you the entryway and lobby will not be crowded and there'll be plenty of spacing in the auditorium. So you sign up and you come, and when you arrive, there's a tightly packed crowd in the entryway, and the lobby is jammed. This is not what you were promised and so you wonder, were you deliberately misled or were your concerns ignored by others? So much of the Christian life is what? It's just thinking of others and putting others ahead of self. We've heard a lot of messages recently about controlling the flesh, subduing the flesh, putting the spirit above the flesh, the, the flesh lust against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. You know what our, our flesh wants to do what our flesh wants to do. Our flesh does not want anybody telling our flesh what it can do, what it can't do. Let's look at this whole social distancing thing as a spiritual exercise. It is my opportunity and my chance to exercise some self-discipline, and control the flesh. We don't know what is so magical about the six feet, but we're going to be concerned enough about others to go ahead and try to remember to stay that far apart. Is, is that, it's really that simple, and I hope that that's fair. We're, we're asking those of you who feel no threat from the virus to be considered of those who may well face a very real threat from the virus and cooperate with your church leaders for the sake of others. We would rather continue increasing the number attending than have to shrink it way down again. So when we dismiss this morning, remember that we're not banning fellowship. We're not prohibiting conversation. We're not saying you can't talk to one another, but you can talk just as well and carry on the same kind of conversation from six feet that you can from two feet. <laughs> so just please, please try to help us with that. Keep it in mind when you come into the auditorium to find your seat and it's, we're a little more spaced out this morning. We, we, we're capacity up to 85 at this point. We've got every other row blocked off so you're not all up close to the person in front of you. What we want you to do is sit all the way to the edge. Sit close to your family members and then as far away from all the other people as you can, scoot out towards the edges, utilize the edge. Most of the time we're saying, scoot toward the middle, make room on the end. No, scoot to the end, leave all kinds of room in the middle of the pew. That's just the way we're trying to space these things out. Again, to be considerate of others. Praise the Lord. Preach in time. Let's pray. God, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you that it's true. Thank you that it's powerful. God, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds this morning. May we, may we learn from you what we need to learn from you. God, guide my thoughts, my lips, my words. Lord, help me to say what needs to be said in the way that it needs to be said. And I, Lord, we are dependent upon your help, your blessing, your presence this morning. And God, we're asking you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Get two places in your Bible to get started this morning. A couple references by way of introduction, then we'll get into the message. Jeremiah 23 and Psalm 139. Jeremiah 23 and Psalm 139. Again, these passages will introduce our topic uh, for the next little while. Jeremiah 23 and Psalm 139. Looking first at the Jeremiah passage. In Jeremiah 23 and verse number 24, uh, 23, Jeremiah 23, 23, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? 
Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? The truth we find in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, uh, the theological term that we give that truth is that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. He fills heaven and earth. You cannot go somewhere where God will not see you. You cannot speak in any location where God will not hear you. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Proverbs chapter 15, all things are open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews chapter 4, he is not far from every one of us. Acts 17, God is in all places, at all times, God is omnipresent. Now, come to Psalm 139 with me, because that doctrine is true regardless of whether you're saved or lost this morning. But if you're saved, that doctrine is more than just a doctrine. That doctrine is a tremendous blessing and help and comfort to our hearts. Psalm 139, verse number 7, the Bible says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, aren't you glad that's just stated for the sake of argument? <laughs> aren't you glad that is not a possibility in your life or in your future this morning? Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, I'm not making my bed in hell. But if I did, <laughs> the Lord would be there. Verse number 9, if I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Here's, here's what we have, a promise from Jesus Christ when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When he said, teach all nations and baptize them. He said, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. He said in Hebrews 13 and verse number 5 that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And because of that, we can boldly say that the Lord is our helper, Proverbs 18, 24 says he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Wherever you are, he'll be right there. When something's stuck, sometimes you want to pull it off, but you can't. There, there, there is no possibility in our lives of being in any place, in any situation, in any circumstance that would, Romans 8, separate us from the love of Christ. That would take us outside of His presence. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The fact that God is omnipresent, it's more than just something we learn in theology class. It is a very real blessing in our daily lives, especially in time, Psalm 139, when we're in darkness, especially in night seasons, especially in trouble and trial and distress. Now, none of us came to church this morning unaware of the fact that God is omnipresent. If, if, if I asked you a true or false question, that really wouldn't trip you up. We, we would all be able to probably even quote some of these verses that we've just read together that point to the fact and give us the promise that God will always be there. But this morning, can we not honestly look at our lives and recognize that there have been times where though we knew these things to be true intellectually, it just didn't necessarily feel like God was there. 
Have you, have you, have you ever gone into one of those night seasons or being, been enveloped in your life in some type of darkness and, and, and you look this way and there's trouble, you look that way and there's upheaval and just everything seems to go wrong all at the same time and have you not asked, maybe not verbally expressed, but thought down deep in your heart, God, where are you? In all of this I thought you said you'd be there I thought you were always with me Gideon expressed it this way in Judges chapter 6 he's talking to that angel as he hides behind the threshing floor and he said if the Lord be with us then why is all this evil befallen us it's the argument that we criticize the skeptic for making the atheist and the agnostic, they deny the existence of God on account of the suffering that is in the world. How can God exist when all of these horrible things happen and we look at that and we scoff at the scoffers? But have we not been there at some point in time? Am I the only one who reads Mark chapter 4 when those disciples are out on the ship with Jesus and he's asleep in the bottom of the ship with his head on a pillow and the storm is rocking the boat and they're afraid for their lives and they go and they wake Jesus up and they accuse him of not caring. Master, carest thou not that we perish? I read that and I think, how can they possibly make that accusation of Jesus? But then I remember storms in my life well, I didn't run and wake Jesus up and ask him that question, but it's only because I wasn't in his physical presence. <laughs> my heart, my heart felt the same things. Am I the only one? Or have, have there not been times in life when we've been less than completely confident in the promises that God made to always be with us. H have there not been times when it just, it didn't, we, we knew it was true, but it didn't feel like it was true. Now hindsight's 2020, and, and when we look back on our lives, we can see what we couldn't see at the moment, and that's even, even in the times where it seemed like God had abandoned us, He was right there with us, Every step of the way. E even in situations where we didn't feel like he was there or we doubted his promises, the problem was not that God had failed to keep his word. The problem was in our perception. We just weren't able to view the situation properly because the trouble or the storm or whatever it was, it, it, it blinded our eyes and clouded our minds. And there is a wonderful illustration of, of, of exactly that truth back in the Old Testament. Come with me. You're in Psalms, probably. Come to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. Be our topic for the sermon this morning. The book of Esther is a beautiful piece of literature. It's really enjoyable to sit down and read ten short chapters in which we are given this true account. This isn't a fable, this isn't a fairy tale, it's not a myth, it's not a legend. This is a real historical account of a poor Jewish orphan girl who becomes the queen of Persia and is used by God to bring miraculous deliverance to his people. I'm going to assume this morning that you're familiar enough with the book of Esther that we don't have to go chapter by chapter and break it down. But the surprising fact is that the book of Esther is the only book in the 66 books of the Holy Bible that never mentions the name of God. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you just heard that for the first time this morning. I remember the shock of hearing that for the first time. Number one, that there would be a book in the Bible that wouldn't mention the name of God. But if, if somebody told me there was such a book and I had to guess which one it would be, 
I would not have guessed the book of Esther. It, it's hard to believe that God's name is never mentioned in the book if you've ever read it. Because you see his hand at work and you see his fingerprints all over the book on every page in every chapter in every line. The fact that his name isn't mentioned certainly doesn't mean that he wasn't there and he wasn't acting and he wasn't involved. Amen. And as, as we sit here this morning and go back and read the history, that's all very, very evident to us. But take a different perspective this morning. Imagine that you're not sitting here reading the book, looking into the past. Imagine that you are the one who is living the events that are recorded in the book of Esther. Just, just for a moment, use your imagination and help me out this morning. What if you were the one taken captive from your homeland and taken to live in another place? What if you were the one whose parents had died, leaving you to be raised by your older cousin? What if you were the one who was rounded up to join the harem of a heathen monarch? What if you were the one this morning whose people were slated for government-sponsored genocide? That was, that was Esther's situation. Do you not think that if that was the story of your life, you may have at one point wondered where God was in all of that? <laughs> this morning, I want, from, from the book of Esther, I want to give you quickly four points on where God was and what He was doing when it didn't seem like He was there. I want to show you where God is in a book that doesn't even mention His name. Because whenever the times in our lives come that we begin to feel as if His promises may not be true in His presence, though we know it's there, we don't perceive that it's there, God is there doing these four things. Number one... God is busy keeping his promises. Come with me to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter number 4. We're not going to read the entire chapter together this morning. But in this chapter, the decree has been made that on a set day, all of the Jews in the entire kingdom would be exterminated. They would be annihilated. They would all be put to death. The decree has gone out. Mordecai has read the decree. Esther has no idea what's going on. And in Esther chapter 4, they are sending messages back and forth to one another. It would have been a lot easier for them. They could have sent some text messages or something. But then Hatak the servant would have been out of a job because he's the one carrying the messages back and forth. In Esther chapter 4 verse 13, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Esther, all of the Jews are to be destroyed. And I know that you haven't revealed your identity, but don't think that you're safe just because of that. Verse number 14, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Did you detect the confidence in Mordecai's question in verse number 14? M included in this message, included in this urging Esther to get involved, Mordecai made this statement, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews. You know what Mordecai was saying to Esther? He was saying, Esther, either God can use you or he's going to use somebody else if he doesn't use you. But you might as well take advantage of this opportunity that you have been given because one way or another, though we don't know how, God is going to deliver 
his people. That was the confidence that Mordecai had. Now, how could he know that? How could he say that? Upon what could that confidence be based? It was based on the promise God made to their fathers in Genesis chapter number 12. Because there was a man by the name of Abram and God had told Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your nation a blessing to all the families of the earth. I'm going to give your nation an eternal inheritance and a piece of land in Palestine. And Mordecai knew the only way that the Jews could be exterminated would be if God were a liar. Because God had promised to keep that nation and preserve that nation and bless that nation and give that nation something they had not yet obtained. And even in the face of this threat of extermination, Mordecai knew that one way or another, God is going to keep the promise that he made. It's like Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. Hebrews 11 tells us what helped Abraham go up that mountain to sacrifice his son to God. God had promised that the seed would come, the blessing would come, the promise would come through his son Isaac. And now God has asked me to lay Isaac on an altar and put him to death. Hebrews 11 said that Abraham figured... If I'm going to kill him, God's just going to have to raise him up because God promised this boy would carry on the lineage. And so confidently he went up that mountain knowing that whatever happened, the only thing that was impossible was that God would not keep his word. It was it was, more, it was way more possible for Isaac to be killed and raised from the dead than it was for God to break his promise. How did David go so confidently and so boldly as a young man down into the valley of Elah to face off against the giant Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17? Because if you read the previous chapter, 1 Samuel 16, he had been anointed the king of Israel. At God's command, at God's instruction, God had promised... That one day David would be the king. And with that promise, he could go to battle against Goliath, knowing that there was no way that battle would end with him not becoming the king. Because he had God's word. He had God's promise. Mordecai is expressing this Same confidence. Here's the situation. We've got a wicked man who's connived and schemed and plotted and conspired against the people of God. And he's gathered this army and he's got a decree. It's sealed with the king's seal. The law of the Medes and the Persians, it can't be changed. The date is marked on the calendar. Not just the Jews in Shushan, but all throughout the kingdom. They are to be uh, terminated, exterminated, put to death on the 13th day of the 12th month. God's people are going down. And you read Esther chapter 4, Mordecai's troubled. He's in sackcloth. He's in mourning. He is desperately calling out to God. But in the middle of all that, there's this undertone of confidence in a God who keeps his promises. Now, he's aware of the fact that this might not go well for him and for his family in the short term. But in the long term, God is not going to let this race of people be destroyed. He's going to use somebody to bring deliverance. And Esther, what if God wants that to be you? Okay, so what's the application to our lives? We haven't been promised that one day we'll become king like David was. We haven't been promised that our children would carry on this Uh, lineage like Abram was. We haven't been promised that whatever race we are would be preserved and and have an, an eternal kingdom and inheritance. But we do have some exceeding great and precious promises. Lord did say, cast your care upon me because I care for you. Lord did say his grace would be sufficient. Lord did say he's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulations. 
He did promise peace that passes understanding to keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He did say we can trust Him with all our heart lean, and lean not on our understanding and all our ways acknowledge Him and He would direct our paths. Even at the times when it doesn't necessarily feel like those promises are true, my feelings do not dictate the truth of God's Word. My feelings don't make the Bible something other than true. My, my temporary lack of confidence or my lack of faith, my inability to detect the presence of God, none of that means that God's not there. None of that means that God is not able to do or will not do what he said he would do. Now, have there not been times in your life where experiences taught you that, that, that when things are going wrong, when your life's breaking down, and I don't know what it might be this morning, I don't know who might need this message now, I don't know who might need this message tomorrow. I don't know what situation is going to bring you into the place where, where we need to be reminded of these truths. But wherever it is, have you not found that in the midst of that problem, in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that difficulty, you, you can find a verse of Scripture and you can plant your feet firmly on that promise and you can cling to what God said in His Word and when you get to the end of that thing, you find out he absolutely meant what he said. Now, now we need to hearken back to that experience the next time we're faced with some kind of opposition. The next time we come into some type of trial. The next time coronavirus shuts down the world. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's difficult for us this morning to try to relate these truths to the current situation because none of us are, have been greatly affected by this situation. It'd be different this morning if it took out your mom. It'd be different this morning if you were on a respirator struggling for breath. It'd be different this morning if your church was still shut down. And you're having to pay $50,000 to an attorney to sue the governor. Right? Let's, let, let's remember when, when our feelings don't necessarily line up with what God said in the Bible, we, we've just got to hold on that much tighter to something God said in his word. Because where is God when it doesn't seem like he's there? He's keeping his promises. Number two, this morning he's busy protecting his people. The previous chapter is Esther chapter 3. It, it, it details Haman's conspiracy. It all started when Mordecai refused to bow to this man. And this man was so full of pride and so full of rage that he was not only content to take out Mordecai, but because Mordecai was a Jew, and, and it was because Mordecai was a Jew that he wouldn't bow to this heathen ruler, then Haman determined it, determined. I, I'm not just going to stop with Mordecai. I'm going to annihilate that entire race of people. Look at Esther, Esther chapter 3. He comes up with this plan and he presents it to the king. In Esther chapter 3 verse 5, When Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. He thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had shown to the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hazuerus, even the people of Mordecai, in the first month, that is the month uh, Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day, and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. So, what date on the calendar are we going to execute these plans? No pun intended. When, when are we going to schedule the genocide? They're going to determine that by casting lots. When does this take place? The 13th day of the first month. What is, what is the farthest distance in time that they could have come up with? If they're taking the same day, they're on the first month, and the farthest month would be the 12th month. And when they cast the lot... The date they came up with 
was the farthest day it could possibly be on the calendar. Just a small coincidence. Just a little happenstance. I don't think so. I can look back in the book of Esther and read how they came up with the date that they scheduled the genocide, and I see God's hand in that. I see God directing in the affairs of men. Now, now here's the thing about it. When Mordecai read the decree that was posted throughout the kingdom, he had no idea how they had come up with that date. He was not aware of the process by which God had intervened to push it as far off in the future as possible to prepare a means of deliverance. So where is God when it doesn't seem like He's there? He's protecting us even when we don't know He's protecting us. Psalm 34, 7, in our lives, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. I, I believe I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again. My wife has this wonderful attitude that I don't have. We spoke last week about patience and my lack thereof. And, and we'll be on a trip and we're trying to get somewhere and we've got a schedule and I'll miss a turn. Because I'm homeschooled and I can't follow directions. And, and I'll get so frustrated. And I'll get so mad. I, I, I can't afford to waste this time and not make it where we need to be. And, and I'm just fuming and it's ridiculous. And, and Lauren, Lauren, she helps so much. Her, her response, her attitude is, God just saved us from a horrible accident. Like, if, 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 if you'd actually gone through that traffic light and not been stopped, we probably would have died five minutes later. We just don't know how God has saved us. It's wonderful that she thinks that way. I don't think that way. But, but here's the point. Mordecai was not aware of how God had protected him. The Jews in Shushan, where they had no idea how God had intervened. Let's think about it from this perspective this morning. Could we even begin to count the times that God has intervened on our behalf and we didn't even know about it? We might be in a situation at times where we just don't know where God is. We don't know what God's doing. But at those times, He's doing what He's always done. And that's grant His people protection and safety. Who was prepared against the day of battle? But safety is the Lord. Take a moment to think about this morning where your life would be if God wasn't there all along. We can't count the times that he's intervened because we're not aware of all the times that he's intervened. And let's, let's be confident in knowing when it doesn't seem like he's there, what he's doing is keeping us safe without our knowledge. His hand is not always so easily detected, but his hand is always at work. Esther chapter 6, point number 3, not only is God keeping his word, not only is God protecting his people, God is honoring the law of sowing and reaping. God is honoring the law of sowing and reaping. Esther chapter 6 is a pivotal chapter in the book. The narrative really takes a turn because at the end of chapter 5, he's already, he's already organized this day when the people of Mordecai will be put to death throughout the kingdom. And, and those plans again are set for the 13th day of the 12th month. But at the end of chapter 5, Haman comes across Mordecai. Again, he refuses to bow. And Haman is so incensed that he can't wait until the 13th day of the 12th month to, to execute Mordecai. So that night he has a gallows erected so he can put that man to death. And the first thing on his agenda the following morning 
is to go to the king and get permission for Mordecai to be executed. So Amon gets up early in the morning and he walks into the palace, but he comes into the palace on the morning when the king has had a fitful night's sleep. And when you're the king of Persia and you have a severe bout of insomnia, you have somebody come in and read you a bedtime story. And the bedtime story that they read were the chronicles of the king and the story that they just so happened to read that night was the time that Mordecai had sniffed out a conspiracy against the king and had ratted out the assassins and spared the king's life. And, 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 and so Ahasuerus, he hears this, he's like, what do we ever do for that guy? Did we ever honor him? Did we ever reward him? So as Haman comes into the king's bedroom, before Haman could ask his question, the king had a question for Haman he said, Haman, what should I do for someone that I just really want to honor? And Haman so stuck on himself, he thought, here's my chance. He didn't even for a moment consider the possibility that it might be someone other than himself. And it sounds like his answer was pretty rehearsed. Get the king's robe, get the king's horse, make a parade, take him through the streets, let everybody know this is the man that the king delights to honor. Haman, great idea. Man, you're so creative. I can always count on you. Thanks. Go do that for Mordecai. And it was the beginning of the end. Because by the end of the day, Haman is hanging on the gallows that he had ordered directed the night before. In the world, they call that poetic retribution. In the Bible, it's called sowing and reaping. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. He that rolleth a stone, it shall return upon him. He that breaketh up an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Now, do you know why? It works that way because God set that in place. It's not karma. It's a God in heaven. And this morning, we don't have time to develop the thought more fully, but, but, but think about it. Why do, people, why do people get bitter against God? Why do people get mad at the Lord? Why, why do we sometimes start to wonder if God's not there? Because we feel as if we have not been rewarded as we should. And we feel as if the wicked have not been punished as they should. Somebody did something to me and God let it happen. God's not just. I've done all these wonderful things. Why are bad things happening to a good person? You know what we need to remember? 2 Chronicles 15, 7, Be strong, therefore, let not, your hand be re- let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Some men's sins open beforehand, some follow after coming before to judgment. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, they that otherwise cannot be hid. It might not be on our timetable, but one day God will settle every score. He is governing over and executing the law. Of sowing and reaping. Now, final point, we gotta we gotta go quickly and wrap this up. Esther chapter four, back there. Read verse 14 again. When when it doesn't seem like God's there, he's keeping his promise, he's protecting his people, he's honoring the law of sowing and reaping, and he's preparing you for future use. He's preparing you for future use. Look, look at Esther chapter 4, verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And, and here's, if you remember a quote from the book of Esther, it's probably this quote. Who knoweth whether thou art come into the kingdom for such a time as this? And you know how it turns out. 
Esther says, if I perish, I perish. She goes before the king. He extends the scepter. She invites him to a banquet. She gets cold feet again, invites him to another banquet. She reveals Haman's plan. He's put to death. Mordecai is exalted. Esther and the king, they, 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 their relationship is deepened. But what did Esther have to go through to get to the place where God could use her as the instrument of the deliverance of an entire race of people? She had to be taken into captivity. She had to be orphaned. She had to be raised by a cousin. She had to be removed from the only family that she knew. She had to go and live in the palace and prepare for six months to a year to have one night in front of the king. And if he chose her to be the queen, great. If he didn't, she would go into the harem and be a concubine the rest of her life and only come if she's called by name. How would you like that to be your life story? <laughs> but if she hadn't gone through every step in that process, she wouldn't have been in the place where she became the instrument that she was in the hand of God. Think about Joseph. You know, the deliverance that God wrought through Joseph. But what did he have to go through in order to get in that place where God could use him? He had to be thrown in a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery by his brothers, imprisoned on false accusations so that God could make him the second ruler in all of Egypt and save the world from the famine that was coming. Think about the Apostle Paul, all that he did for God. How God has used him not only in his lifetime but the thousands of years since what did Paul have to have? He had to have a messenger from Satan to buffet him daily. Where did Paul write most of the books inspired by the Holy Spirit in our New Testament today? A prison cell. What did Paul have to do so that God's strength could, could come? He had to be made weak. The times in our lives when it just doesn't seem like God's there, what he's doing is he's trying to use that so that he can use us, perhaps in a greater way than we could have ever imagined. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It didn't say everything in life is good. It didn't say everything from, in life is from God. But everything in life can be used by God to accomplish His purpose in us and through us. So this morning, when, it, when, when the Lord's presence is difficult to detect, the problem is always our perception. Because in a book that never mentions His name, here's what He's doing. He's keeping His promises. He's protecting His people. He's overseeing, sowing, and reaping. He's preparing a little Jewish orphan girl to do incredible things. For him. Here's what Mordecai had to do. He had to believe that promise. He had to claim that promise. Here's what Esther had to do. She had to submit to God's plan. She had to reject bitterness. She had to put her life in God's hand and let him have his way. Lord, help us remember those truths in times that we need them. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word this morning. God, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your power. Thank you, dear God, that we have every reason to have the utmost confidence in your word, in your ability, in your plans. God, help us. Lord, help us to trust you. When things are going great, help us to trust you. When our lives fall apart, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. The piano will play a hymn for just a moment, give an opportunity to reflect on these truths from the Bible this morning. Go ahead and pick a song, Lauren, and start playing. We'll have just a moment of reflection, and then we will be dismissed.
Praise the Lord. Thanks again for being here for the warm-up service this morning. We're going to dismiss quickly. we got to scurry out, give the cleaning crew some time to get things ready for 1030. Please remember, for the sake of others, for the sake of testimony, fellowship. Just do so at a distance. Keep some space. Help us out with that. That would be a blessing. The piano's going to play. The ushers are going to come. We'll be dismissed from the back. And again, just go ahead and, and, and hurry on out so we can get things cleared and ready for the next service. Thank you. Praise the Lord. God bless you.